Welcome to Greenly Art Spaces Artist Talk by Nadia Little Warrior. My name is Kimberly Hawking, and I am the director and curator of Greenly Art Space. For those of you who don't know us yet, welcome to Greenly Art Space, a 501c3 nonprofit gallery dedicated to enriching lives and cultivating community through art. This is done through creating contemplative art shows, bringing art to the community, and providing a space for art making, mentoring, and art therapy. For those of you who do know us, welcome back. We're so glad you're here for this wonderful event. So this presentation is thanks to Greenlee's recent local impact grant from the California Arts Council. This grant serves to highlight the artwork of underrepresented populations. As a recipient of this grant, we are working with the Nesh Canoe Cut, a California Native American artist network. We'll have one more artist talk by Peggy Fontenot, and you're welcome to sign up for that after this um, after this talk. And we'll also have a closing and storytelling um, with song on the November 29th. So you won't want to miss that. See our website and social media postings for more info. We would also like to thank the California Arts Council for their generous support. And we would like to thank the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture for their operational grant, which has helped us to keep our physical gallery space in Signal Hill. Finally, I'd like to thank our many individual monthly donors. Um, you guys are amazing. All of our individual donors, you're the heart and soul of this organization. And without your support, um, we wouldn't be able to continue doing the types of things we do to serve artists in the community. If you appreciate programs like this one, please support Greenlee by going to our website to make a donation. So Greenlee has in installed We Are All Related, an exhibition of Nesh Kanuka artists. This exciting exhibit has many different types of Native American artwork. We have three of Nadia's beautiful gourds on display at this exhibit, which is now available for viewing by appointment. So Nadia Little Warrior studied art academically in Texas, Oklahoma, and California, as well as private studies with various artists. Six times her people of the citizen Potawatomi Nation have honored this award-winning artist known for her gourds around the world. She has exhibited her art in many prestigious locations, including the Southwest Museum, Antelope Valley Indian Museum, Satwiwa Native American Culture Center and Museum, Mallard Sheets Gallery, William S. Hart Park and Museum, the Heard Museum, Red Earth, the Idlejord Indian Museum, the City of Lancaster Fine Arts Museum, the Jean Autry National Center of Western Heritage, and the Harkmangna Culture Center. Both the Southwest Museum and the Jean Autry Museum of Western Heritage have sold Nadia's art in their museum gift stores. Nadia has also been a guest speaker at NASA on two occasions and received the National Treasures Grant from the County of Los Angeles. With a history in art and a distinctively Potawatomi, Nez Perce, and Cherokee heritage, Nadia Little Warrior is one of today's most dedicated artists of contemporary Native American art. Her collectors span the world from China to Spain and include such people as Dr. Joyce Brothers, screenwriter Lisa Atkinson, actress Jennifer Tilly, and actors Dennis Haysbert and Troy Evans. Nadia Little Warrior's vision is one that's both vibrant and deeply traditional. Her beautiful gourd art has a naturalistic immediacy that also displays authentic Native American motifs. Part of the Nesh Kanuka Artists Collective, Nadia's work can be found in museums and exhibits all over the world. Her work is inspiring, filled with story, and beautifully created. Nadia is an artist I admire and greatly respect. Let's all welcome today's artist, Nadia Little Warrior. Yay! Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Kimberly, for that lovely introduction. I uh, am excited to be here and share about uh, what I do with the board people. Uh, my studio is called Spirit Vessel Studio uh, because every gourd has its own spirit. They're beings just like we are, and they have their own DNA. So welcome to Spirit Vessel Studios. I'm a descendant of three different tribes and a little bit Irish and a little bit French, as Kimberly uh, uh, told you before. 
And my grandmother used to introduce me to the world as she's Indian three ways from Sunday because of the three different tribes. So that was a little running joke that we, we had, my grandmother and I. Um, I had a mother who was an artist and a fantastic artist at that. She was collected by the Coca-Cola company uh, and uh, purchased from all over the United States, different uh, corporations. She received the Hallmark Artist Grant uh, to study her art at 15 years old when uh, we were, they were in Kansas City where I was born. Um, she brought me to Texas where my uh, maternal grandparents were on a freight car with the hobos in 1949. And that's one of, actually one of my first memories. So we were always a pretty exciting bunch. So I, I'm very grateful to the fact that once we got to Texas, we ended up on a cattle ranch. And I, I, I was blessed with the um, nothing but the horizons in all directions. So I, have, I had an unlimited supply of art supplies and an unlimited space for total imagination. And I'm very grateful to my mom and creator for all of that. And my grandparents who also helped very closely in raising me, taught me many things that were Indian in nature and in tradition. They just didn't label them as that. So I've spent my adult life learning all the many things that I already knew all over again and being able to relate them to the Indian heritage and the brilliance of our ancestors to whom I'm grateful every day. And with that, I'll tell you that this is my grandmother and my grandfather. I called them mom lady and daddy John. They were the people that we moved from uh, Kansas City to go live with. And they were the two, she was Potawatomi in French and he was Cherokee in Irish. And they were the two people that were very instrumental in my being Indian and being protected at the same time. They used to drop me off at school so I could walk a couple of blocks so people wouldn't see that my family were Indian. My mother did that too. Um, it, it's funny, in their younger years, they looked more Indian than they did in their older years, I guess because of the gray hair, I'm not, I'm not really sure. But they were very protective of our identification growing up and being in a public school. So I appreciate them and love them. And they're always with me. And they're going to shake their finger at me a couple of times during this process, I'm sure. But in a loving way. Uh, I'd like to show you one picture of my mom that I have with me that I didn't have online. This is my mom in her regalia as the head dancer with her back to the camera. And the reason that particular picture is so important to me is because humor was very important to all of us at home. And her favorite story was when the young man found his way all by himself unannounced at uh, Georgia O'Keeffe's front door. And after knocking on the door and having Georgia open it, he said, I've come all this way to see you. I hope that that's okay. And to that, Georgia said, well, now you've seen my front. And she turned around and she said, now you've seen my back. And she slammed the door in his face. <laughs> and it's always just cracked my mother up that Georgia just did not like surprises, did not like to be intruded upon without notice. And that just, that picture, that photograph, when my sister sent it to me, made me full of joy because it really epitomized my mom's personality. She was very powerful. She taught me to be an activist. And there she is. Oh, there's her front. Look at that. That's the year she was head dancer at the Potawatomi Gathering and uh, powwow in Shawnee, Oklahoma at what we called Fire Lake. 
is part of our people, uh, the Potawatomi, we are the people of the fire. Or in Bodewadmi, in my language, uh, like the French used to always say, the, those people who are always starting the fires, because we were the keeper of the fires of the seven nations from the Great Lakes of, uh, uh, of Michigan and, and uh, Wisconsin and what's now Illinois. Chicago, the city of Chicago, we were, our family was mentioned in a book about that uh, called Chicago. And they called uh, us the people of the fire, but they also referred to my many great grandfathers ago as a real scoundrel because he built and owned the Saginaw Hotel there and he was a fiddler and a gambler. So they, they knew him to be quite a character. In 1547, uh, a Frenchman named Jean Baptiste came, uh, worked his way at the St. Lawrence Seaway and didn't know if it was for a debt or a crime. So we always joked about him helping us be outlaws and, and teaching us how to take care of ourselves in times of trouble. And, uh, so that's when the French came into my blood. Um, prior to that, though, I will go back and give a brief uh, international history lesson. From about 500 to 850 AD, we did international trade with the Vikings, who were really considered by us to have discovered the continent, the North American continent. At that time, from Nova Scotia, we, we it did international trade with them for a long time and they taught us about metal work uh metallurgy i think it's called i don't know if i'm saying that right however they were very wasteful in the opinions of our uh, elders and we went also up the what is now known as the saint Lawrence seaway into the great lakes area the huron went with us and we settled in there and and made it part of our world and uh, in, in, Mich in, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, there's a town called um, Escanaba in Potawatomi, that means Iron Man. And once we got there in between 800 and 900 um, AD, we started working with metals there and Escanaba is, was a, a mining town for quite some time. I don't know if it still is. And um, uh, you can't find that in history books here. That's in my family stories. However, I'm told that if you research uh, in the Netherlands and different museum areas, they have a history of the Vikings doing international trade with the natives of this continent. So that might be a fun thing for you to look up. Now, um, I, I'm gonna switch over a little bit to talking about the Gord people pretty much. Uh, get them and they're very dirty. This is an example of a, a very dirty gourd. I'm not going to open it right now because it's kind of stinky, but there's seeds in there. And when I do open it up, of course, I'll wear a mask and I'll clean it a little bit again on the outside, but I'll be scraping the inside and saving the seeds, which I do. I save gourd seeds all the time. You can see some here. These white ones will not grow and I put both in so you could see. But the brown ones are the ones that you can plant and they grow quite well. They love water. So you have to be able to water them a lot. And they, they grow into all different sizes, many sizes. Here's a kind of a, a smaller bottle, bottle gourd and I, I've cut it in a way that it can be a mask when I get to design it. You can see it has all of its markings. Um, the characters uh, of each gourd is different. Some are smooth and clean and unblemished. And um, some are, they just have all kinds of personality. You could line three different gourds up, put, three to, uh, put the same dye or coloring on uh, each gourd and it will come out different on each gourd because they have just as different DNA as two leggeds. You know that's us, right? And I, after cleaning out the inside, this is generally what it looks like. A lot of scraping and sanding is involved. This is 
not for sissies. It's hard work, actually. It, it, and you have to be patient. Um, they, they talk to me. I, I, I listen to them on purpose. My grandparents taught me this. It's very important uh, that I share it with you. I, I share this with all my, my classes uh, and, and all the places I demonstrate. My, my grandparents taught me that whatever I'm doing with my hands, whatever I'm feeling in my heart and whatever I'm thinking in my head, that's coming through my hands, not from me, but from spirit, from creator. And it goes into whatever I'm doing, whether it's my artwork or gardening or cooking, for example. My grandmother, sometimes when I would come home from school, she would say to me, you have to cook dinner tonight because I'm mad and I don't want to make anybody sick. And, and uh, nobody questioned that. No more conversation would be, I just cook dinner. And uh, my grandfather was grateful because usually she was mad at him. <laughs> and we had a lot of laughing around the house like that. Every night at dinner, my grandparents would start this conversation of mom lady would say, John, you have to go before me because I don't want to be here without you. And daddy John would say, Evelyn, you'll be going before me because I don't want to you to be disappointed and finally when they wouldn't stop I would just say please please I'll take care of whoever's left and I did so that was another part of the the daily ritual with mom lady and daddy John is I'll take care of you oh look at this big picture thank you okay well there's my grandparents he, my daddy John has on the white pants and the black ribbon shirt, and my mama lady has on the turquoise skirt and the and the deep turquoise uh, shawl. And all of us are sitting up around them, beside them, behind them. I'm there, and my cousins are all there, and my sister, my brother. Look at that! My sons are up there. My mom. Look at all those people up there. Look at that. What a group. That was in the bleachers at the powwow in Shawnee one year in the late 90s. Isn't that nice? Oh, my cousin Barbara. Yeah. Thank you for showing that one. I, I, I love talking about all those wonderful people that I gr got to grow up with. And uh, heritage was very important to them. And being Indian was something that uh, was very important to them. So thanks for that, that shot. Um, like I said, we like to laugh. There was a lot of humor and sometimes only the family got the humor. I'm sorry, Snoop Dogg wants to be part of this conversation, but I'm not going to jump up and grab him. Okay. <laughs> so here, here is, um, on our list, if you would, gentlemen, in the technician room, in the studio, I'm going to hold up feathers one which I'll show on the screen. And feathers one is just a piece of a gourd. And you'll see that in the curve of the gourd, you can cut out a feather that actually has a, a shape to it. So this, this is inspired by Hawk. And um, I love honoring all the flying beings with such things. Uh, this is an ornament or it can hang on the wall with such pieces. And the second one I'll show you is Feathers 2. I know, original names, right? Feathers 2 is second on our slide. And Feathers 2 is a more of a, a honor of a prayer feather that many people would use for literally uh, talking to creators through the smoke when uh, sitting by the fire, burning sage, adding tobacco and cedar and uh, sweet grass. So I wanted to make something in honor of how we talk to creator. So that's feathers too. I, I hope it's a long series and, and, and I hope I get to show you others in the future someday, far away from now. I make a lot of ornaments. This will be a I don't know if that's what's next. Oh no, you know what's next? Well, let's talk about the butterfly races, shall we, gentlemen? If you bring that up, please. 
they're number three on our slide list. The butterfly races is hand strung. The beads are not beaded into it, but they are hand strung around it. So there, there's openings. The dream catchers are built into the gourd. And I, I use the faux or false sinew. And I made this one, of course, in honor of the monarchs who were in trouble at one time. I understand they're coming back just a little bit better. If you'll notice on the bottom there, there's a little edge underneath them and it has flowers so they never go hungry. And the beads are rep representing the different ways in which the waterfall might splash around where they get a drink. So that was the first in the butterfly series. And I really uh, appreciated them. And uh, I know they live somewhere near the, the Pacific Coast in Ventura County. Yeah, the couple who bought it, that lady had looked at it for a long time. And uh, the gentleman bought that for their anniversary for her. So I was very grateful. I'm going to skip around, guys, because I'm going to run down to um, the butterfly dreams, which is actually number 14. I want, I want people to see the two together, if, if you don't mind. So slide number 14 is called Butterfly Dreams. And uh, as you can see there, the dream catchers are a little bit bigger. They're um, uh, built into the gourd with a willow frame and uh, the false sinew. And the little feather that's in the circle of one of those dream catchers is a piece of a gourd made into a feather. Those blue butterflies, which have a beautiful scientific name, which I can never pronounce, they were in danger. I read about them in the LA Times. And uh, I started working on this as, to be the butterfly uh, second in the series. You can see they also have flowers, so they never go hungry. And while I was working on it, I wasn't paying too much attention to the news, but I was having good thoughts and uh, sending good vibes to the, that particular group of butterflies so that they may have a better chance of survival. After I finished it, about four or five months later, I read in the LA Times again where they had built sanctuaries in somewhere near Marina del Rey or Playa del Rey and Brazil, where these butterflies travel back and forth, which amazes me. And, and that they were doing better and that they were projected to maybe be okay now. So I always like to show people the way that it works and, and be grateful to creator that somebody was listening to those thoughts while I, I was working. I didn't do it. You know, I can't fix anything, but I know somebody who can. And um, I'm all, always happy to share little, little coincidences and little stories of things that I get to learn along the way. I, I, sh I, I um, I'm grateful that I get to share things in those ways. So um, there's, there's uh, going through a few more um, slides, if I could, uh, number four, the hummingbird's ladder is um, living somewhere in Arizona. Uh, the people bought it from me at Santa Fe Indian Market in New Mexico, and they told me they were taking it home to Arizona, so I know that's where it is. Now, once again, it has the inferences of prayer with a little louder going down into a private place. Now, I, I'm not Hopi or Southwestern by uh, genetics, but I have a lot of friends who are, and they've been very generous uh, w with me in, in sharing uh, what they can of stories. So I, I always, uh, I like to put hummingbirds and ladders together for some reason. It, it, they, they are little spirits that come visit us, you know, those hummingbirds bring us messages. So whether you think you can hear them or not, just be open to the message and it'll, it'll get where it's supposed to be. And as you can see again, flowers, hummingbirds gotta have food, right? So that is, uh, hummingbird's ladder. Um, okay, now we can talk about chili peppers. That's number five slide. And although the slide you're going to see is a is a ristra 
of, of what they call banana gourds, and I just can't see anything but chili peppers. So that's a, a chili pepper ristra. And here is a chili pepper ornament. And you see all these little strings are gonna have beads and all those beads are gonna have a story to that this little chili pepper ornament will be telling everybody. So there's the chili peppers. People seem to love them. I have to make them often, <laughs> which I enjoy, of course. Um, on to a little work in progress uh, story. I don't have a slide for that. Uh, you may laugh. This guy, this guy is right now is called Snaggletooth. I, I don't know if that's who he or she will end up being. Um, actually looks like a two spirit is coming through here and I won't know un until I get a complete picture. Sometimes they take longer. Each one takes its own time coming into being. This will also be a mask. And um, that again will be finished inside. But you can see how it's literally a work in progress. And he, she likes to hang out with me. Everywhere I go to, to show my work or display, she's been traveling around making me talk about uh, the progress. And the little ornament says, I showed you this one before. This is naked, it's a naked gourd. Here's one that has its first whitewash with a little Southwest geometric design. And uh, it'll be a, a nice little ornament. And here's one also in progress with, as you can see, a healing hand and just a simple little border. And um, it, it's coming together quite well. It's still telling me something else and I'm waiting for it to come through more clearly, but that's a work in progress as well. And I'm happy to say I also find these teeny tiny miniature uh, full grown gourds and they go into slots on a printer's drawer quite nicely. Put this over here. And then I'm gonna put this one, this little red pot, another little gorgeous one over here and Eventually that little drawer that used to hold letters for printing presses will be full of gourds. There won't be an empty spot on there. Everyone will have a different board person, a different pot. I can say that and laugh because, you know, being Potawatomi, they refer to us as the pots. Ha <laughs> ha. Here's another little pot. It's just a happy guy, you know. They come in all shapes and sizes and they show me all kinds of pictures. Here's the top of a, of a gourd. It, it, it might even have been the top of Hummingbird's Ladder for all I remember, but it's a burden basket right now. And for those of you who don't know what a burden basket is, we used to make baskets in this shape, big enough to hold on our back, right? And when we were gathering, we would throw the nuts or berries or whatever we were gathering into our basket and take it, take it home. And once we got the basket home and emptied, then if we hung the basket outside our door before people knocked on the door, they knew that they should leave their problems with the, with the, out, with the burden basket outdoors and they can take them home with them after our visit. However, if they knocked on the door and they came in and the burden basket was inside the house, by the door, they knew that if they had a real problem, they could come talk to us about it. And we would do our best to be gracious and listen and support them with that problem in whatever way it needed to happen. So we were, we were always, we always had our ways of communication. They weren't always verbal, but they were powerful and meaningful. And um, with that, um, I have a slide number six, if you would, gentlemen. There's, uh, we named it Bear Face. It's part of a larger gourd, but I like showing the bear part. You can see where I etched in the bear claws over to the purple side. 
and you can see over at the other side where there's some oak leaves. That piece uh, sold in Indiana, and, and I was honored that a young man came in. Per that was his first gourd purchase. He explained to me his story to me when he walked up to that was that he was impressed by the bear and felt comforted by the bear and that he would, had been looking. He had a lot of pottery, but he said he had been looking for something in a gourd. And so I was honored that he took that bear home with him. And, and I always, I'm always grateful and I always keep all the people that find my gourds. It seems as though they always uh, recognize them right away. And I always remember them and I always have the honor of having met them and I get to remember their faces when uh, I ask Creator to be with all, all the people. Uh, I, I ask Creator, of course, to be with all the people that I know and all the people that I don't know. Uh, and, and some of the people that I meet along the way, um, I don't know, they leave an impression that just requires a little extra prayer, if you know what I mean. Um, oh, did we have a sl slide number seven? I believe we do. This is called Grandfather's Prayers. And, um, you know, it's the leather on it. Thank you for bringing it up. The leather on that piece is from my wedding dress, which oh, I forgot to bring the picture of in here. Um, and the, the parrot feathers are from uh, a dear friend, Barbara Ralston's uh, parrot. There are three blue parrot feathers. And it's called Grandfather's Prayers with leather and laces. And then that little part at the bottom is a pendant, an antique pendant that I rescued from a garage sale. It's got a little piece of coral in it. And um, I never bothered to polish the silver because it felt like it needed to be the antique that it was. So it's repurposed. It's something that didn't get thrown in the wastebasket or lost in, in family heirlooms in the attic. And I saged it and I'm grateful for having that. So it goes into a show next Wednesday. Um, and and I'm, I'm happy to, that both, both the Feathers and Grandfather's Prayers will be put into a show at the Santa Clarita Artist Gallery in Newhall, California for, for a few weeks to be on the walls for a virtual art show. And um, I don't know why, but it does remind me of my grandfather. <laughs> and then, oh, Birch Basket is on, next up. Let's, let's get to it. That's funny. This pendant and my earrings are made, those little round circles are made of birch bark. And when you find birch bark, birch basket, uh, birch basket is a gourd made into a basket to look like a birch basket. And you can see those little squares with copper on the corners. And those are the outside of the, of the birch. And uh, I mean, the, yeah, the outside of the birch and the inside of the birch. When we take the birch bark off the tree, we never take all of it. It's very important that uh, you leave plenty of bark. You just take what you need in that moment. We use birch bark to cover our wigwams uh, in, in the Great Lakes area. And that would be for those in California. Oh, look, you found one. Thank you so much. There you go. There's a wigwam with the birch bark. And um, in California, they make those uh, same ops. They call them ops. And, and they make the frame with willow, just like we did. Our frames were made with willow. And uh, the California Indians use tule, the Chumash, and, and the people down there, especially in Southern California. And the, the uh, Great Lakes people used birch barks to cover them. So that, that was an interesting lesson for me. I, I was very grateful when... Uh, I moved to California. My grandfather reminded me that I needed to go uh, find the people that lived on that land, on um, this land, uh, and make my, make it known to them that I was there, and and ask them 
if they would to help me know how to be kind to this land. And as every, uh, every person will tell you, every, every native person will tell you, wherever you live, that land is yours to take care of, not to own. You know, it, it's yours to help survive and do better for all the generations after us. Very, very important information. So the first Native people I met here in California were Chumash and Tatevian and uh, Tongva. And I, I just, I love all of everybody that I've met along the way, of course, but that, that they were generous uh, to share with me, the Tongva and the Tatevian and the Chumash people. Uh, I also met Hoopa from up north and um, uh, Shoshone uh, even uh, from Nevada who lived here. So everybody was generous and helped me be feel comfortable and welcomed me and, and taught me certain things that it was I was grateful to learn and I was able to go back and uh, call my grandfather and brag and be grateful with him that uh, he reminded me that this was important and I should never forget the, uh, who I am. Um, as a card carrying Indian, um, since I was 16 years old, being uh, Indian was not, you know, uh, foreign to me like it, 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 it can be to some people who don't know their heritage. So again, it just brings up gratitude, big gratitude. Um, I'm gonna show you a piece that's not on the slide and then we'll bring up um, number nine. Um, this, is, this, is, <laughs> this is called Texas Rose, right? Or Cowgirl Rose. Uh, depending on how you look at it. But the thing about this little gourd is I'm not sure yet if it's going to be a purse or if it's just going to be, you know, a bowl that sits around. Uh, but that that's her pretty much finish, except for whether she's going to be a purse or not. And when you bring up that next shot of number nine, my pony shoes is a purse out of a... A canteen gourd, which that other gourd was as well. And that's called my, my pony's shoes because, of course, I grew up on that cattle ranch and there's just a little Indian and a little cowboy everywhere I go. And um, so I, I like showing her. She's in a, a gallery of, uh, right now on New Hall called uh, uh, Abe's on Main in New Hall, California. So she's showing off out there for the people. So that's my pony's boots purse. Uh, going along with being just, you know, a little bit in his purse. My, my grandpa on my father's side was Bird Buzan and he, he comes from the Nez purse. So I, I like to honor him in, in that way. I loved that his only name and his full name was Bird, B-I-R-D. Buzan, that was his name. And I love that part of him and that part of me. And uh, he, he was a truck driver in Kansas City. And uh, I, 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 I'm honored that one of my close friends, Peggy Fontenot, did some research and found out uh, my history of my birth father's family. So I get to know that. So. Um, the next piece on, I want to show you and, and talk to you a little bit about is um, uh, slide number 10, Peace at the Altar, which is the only true, well, it's not the only one, but it's the most political piece I've done. It's a recent one. I finished it uh, uh, in 2019, I think. Um, it, it says peace. I, I you know, tacked in the word peace into a tiny piece of copper and attached it to a, a tiny piece of birch bark. And it's uh, sitting up there so you can see that it's peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, at the altar. And that little shard of gourd sitting on those four strands of leather suspended in air there, uh, that's an altar with a, 
a symbol of a buffalo head. That buffalo head's made out of a small piece of gourd as well, and it's filled with uh, resin and rhinestones and silver glitter uh, to to depict the holiness of the altars where we pray, where uh, it sits before the fire. And uh, there's a little rosette of leather uh, next to it. It's a little copper stud in the center, uh, representing the food or the flowers that we would place by the altar uh, when we go to pray. And um, the hands, of course, those are healing hands reaching up to the universe. This whole piece is a a slant of the universe where we know creator is there for us. And that's where we send up the smoke. And the little adobe figures at the bottom, the little designs have glitter on them too, representing that snow that sits on those adobes sometimes in our houses. And there's little metal stars all around representing what, what the men and the women on the planet uh, get to look at when they look up. So thank you for showing that piece at the altar. And um, so Buckskin Dancer is next on our slide list. And I wanna talk about those ladies. I don't wanna to go too much longer. I can't go too much longer actually. But Buckskin Dancers in the arena at the powwows and gatherings, they're dancing with prayers in their hearts and in their minds for all the other people because we're taught to pray for others, not for ourselves because all the other people are praying for us. So they go out there in those leather buckskin dresses and dance their little hearts out no matter how hot or how cold it is. So I'm grateful to those dancers. And while I'm kind of getting running out of time here before I go, I'm gonna show you another work in progress. This will be a lamp. I'm gonna just sit it right here. I'm at the point where I'm weaving pine needles, which is a slow process for me. So the pine needles will go all the way down here. It's got different symbols wood burned into it, just to represent, you know, the rainy clouds and there's a bear, there's thunder, there's a hand again, a healing hand, uh, dragonflies who also come visit us from spirit world and water. Uh, did I say bear? <laughs> And hiding down there, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a pony. And he's kind of covered up with threads, I know. But these these pine needles came from Haramakna up in the Angeles Crest National Forest. I soak them in water and then I apply them as a weaving process onto the gourd. And again, it's, it's what we're thinking in our heart and feeling in our head. Don't forget that part. You have to have an open mind and an open heart and be willing to see things you've never seen before and hear things you've never heard before. When you're working with the Gord people, you just hold them and listen to them. They'll tell you what they want to wear. People ask me if I make the Gords and I tell them, creator makes the Gord people and I get to dress them up. And that's my story. I hope you liked it. My time is up. I, I enjoyed uh, talking to you about the Gord people and showing you how some of my work gets done. I strike all my designs with the wood burning tools and I use leather dyes, inks, and metallic uh, powders to put my colors in. So thank you very much. I, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, walking on earth with the knowledge that you're not alone. Bamapi Mina. Thanks, Nadia. You actually do have about mm, 13 more minutes. So if you wanted oh. to share about your uh, 
the one that's to the oh, right of you. Oh, my shield yeah. in my gallery? That would be lovely. Oh, and yeah, make sure to can... share about your little, uh, yeah. your uh, clown one, too. So oh, you do have sure. a bit more time. So uh, please tell us some more stories. Oh, We're listening. Kimberly, I will. Gosh, I, I, I guess I looked at the clock wrong. <laughs> you know, I'm old. This is Gord Gallery 2. Gord Gallery 1 sold at the Autry Museum in Denmark at a... Um, two years ago, not this year, no, last year. So uh, this this is this year's version, but we don't really have shows right now uh, to go to in person. So Gord Gallery 2 is hanging out with me here. And what this is, is um, 26 miniature baby gourds, like the ones I showed you uh, a while ago that are behind me in the printer's tray. Uh, 25 are here. They're all just hanging out, showing off. Here's a little baby mask, a baby bear mask, looking to be protecting, representing the West, which is, you know, usually there's a bear or something up here representing the West where bear sits and protects us while we're sleeping. But this is another, just one quarter of my journey wheel is a little bit political. It's red, white, and blue. For, for all the different reasons that um, we might be stressing over right now, or not so much today, maybe. The, it starts in the east where the sun comes up. And it, it, uh, it, it goes over, whoops, yeah, to the south where the heat comes from. And... Uh, Am I doing that correct? Yeah. And to the west and over to the north where, this, where the cold comes from. So it's got a snowflake up there. So it represents the four directions and the journey wheel of life, which all comes, you know, full circle. Some people call them medicine wheels. I don't care. I'm not medicine. I believe the plant people are the medicine people. And um, that 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 journey wheel is when I like to uh, honor those directions and and the directions that have the power. Um, Grandfather Frank Fools Crow w was once asked, "How did he come to be Catholic?" He said, "Well, you know, I'm I, I'm really uh, pretty certain that we're all of the same." Uh, insides and when I met with those black robes he said I pointed out to them that we have the four directions they have the four cardinals we're all we all have the same creator he said so it didn't matter to him if they wanted him to be catholic or not because he knew there wasn't any difference in anybody so that's part of my journey wheel story I don't tell that story very often uh, and there's a couple of books by Thomas Mayles about Grandfather Frank Fool's Crow. And I think he might want you guys to know about that and read them. Um, yeah, that's the story of the, of the Gord Gallery, too. And I found this box. From, it's called doTERRA Oils. I'll show you the back. I found three or four boxes that are shaped differently, but have little uh, homes for gourds in them. I found them at, I found those boxes at Goodwill, and I was really tickled uh, th that those box. Well, actually, Peggy Fontenot found them, and she brought them to my attention. So I couldn't do anything without my friends, Peggy Fontenot and Cat High. And, Kimberly Hawking, Gail Warner, and all you wonderful people that are part of my family. Uh, so I like to include everybody who enhances my opportunity to tell the stories of all my gourd people. So this guy, he's kind of fun. He's the second in the gourd gallery series, and hopefully I'm working on the next one, and it'll get done before too long. Um yeah, that, that's a fun one. You know, that's funny you mentioned that I had a little time. You know what, you know what's a, a great one for them to see is, uh, 
if we have that time, red, white, and blues. That's another, I keep saying, oh, it's my only political piece. Oh no, it's a little political. Well, this is actually the first political piece that I did. And I guess I've done more political pieces than I realized. Up at the top of red, white, and blues, of course, is the dominant, the flag of the dominant society. At the bottom of the red, white, and blue uh, stripes that are underneath that flag, that's the red, that's the blood of the American Indians that the colonists, the white people uh, shed while they were creating what they considered to be their red, white, and blue country. And the um, down below blue and white and naked stars, the naked stars being the indigenous people of, of our continent, Turtle Island, and the white stars of course being the dominant society and those there's the, a lot of blues in there that gave me the blues uh, and there's a definitely disrespectful use of the uh, American federal nickel Indian nickel federal money uh, I took that nickel and I tied it on there just to say hey this is a button and it was our bison and uh, to honor those bison that were all slaughtered actually. So I'm glad they're still hanging out with us, those bison. Um, when preyed upon properly, they make really good chili by the way. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm down to two last slides actually, I'll be quick and say, oh, I mentioned Turtle Island. You know what I just remembered? I had this friend and she was uh, uh, really excited. She called me up one day from Malibu in, at her house and said, oh, I found somebody who's gonna feng shui my house. And I said, oh yeah, well, that's good. And I listened to her excited story and she told me all about what they were gonna do and everything. At the end, I was a little quiet and I said, so, are you gonna move your house to China? And she said, what? And I said, you know, that's where feng shui needs to be is on the dragon's back. Cause we live on Turtle Island. You need to drive up the road and talk to the Chumash people and they'll tell you what you need to do to your house to make it safe. And I, I don't think she ever talked to me again after that, but you know, Turtle Island, Dragon Spat, there's something to all that. I really do believe it. So uh, I don't know if I've used up all my time, but if I have it, we can talk about Woodland Flowers, which is slide number 12. And uh, I hand beaded all those beads right into that gourd. And it was the first one I hand beaded. Peggy taught me how to bead. So I got busy and beaded on a gourd. Um, I was honored that it won a ribbon at the Idle George Indian Museum. And I am grateful. I, I, I really enjoyed working on that piece. And it was very exciting to win a ribbon with it. So that's called Woodlands Flowers because the seven nations around the Great Lakes are known as the Woodlands people. Algonquin speaking woodlands people. And there you have it. That I believe is a Winnebago design, but Potawatomi are especially known for flowers. We have them all over our regalia. And um, that that's, uh, that's where that came from. Last slide that we haven't seen, number 13, Tears for the Old Ones. Uh, this is on loan from the Chuck uh, Greenberg Estate. His beautiful wife Joy lets me show it off. Um, it's in honor of the ancestors that gave of themselves before us. Uh, some were lost on the trail of death, um, which is in 1838, the same time as the Trail of Tears from the East Coast. The Great Lakes people were marched down on the Trail of Death into Kansas. And uh, oh, yeah, it reminds me of Father Pettit saved us from the blankets uh, from with smallpox. He warned us that those soldiers were gonna be giving us blankets and they would make us sick. So 
we were saved by that Jesuit priest, Father Pettit. So that that's an important part of our heritage that that we Potawatomi have and are proud of. He was kind to us. And I, I don't know how my time is doing, but I sure have loved talking to you about all my Gord people and my work. And I don't know if we have time for questions, if there are any questions or not. We I, have time. I, we have uh, time, Nadia. So oh, um, good. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's my honor. You honor my ancestors and my family. I'm grateful. Bamapi Mina. Oh, wonderful. Well, yeah, we're, we're really blessed. Hello. Now you get to see somebody else. Um, and thank you so much, Nadia, for that beautiful presentation and just your heart and your sharing about um, your heritage and your ancestors. It's thank yeah, you. just beautiful to be able to listen to. I want to thank my son, Nathan, who's right here. Thank you, Nathan. Working everything. Mm -hmm. And my um, husband, Dave, who's in the other room, I think right now, but he's helped with setting a lot of things up. And so thank you guys so much for helping out with this. So we're going to go ahead and get to questions now. Okay. Um, so let's see here. Um, first, Carol Churchill wanted to say that your grandmother's dress, Nadia, looks like a 1960 Vogue pattern that her grandmother <laughs> would sew on her Singer tread, Treadle sewing machine. She yes, was. <laughs> it's very, it very much is probably that one. <laughs> How funny is that? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, her question is for you. She wanted to ask, um, what is buckskin? Is it a type of leather or a form of design? Strips cut into leather? She wanted to know what buckskin is. So, the buckskin dress. Yes, it's a, for, for my, from my uh, understanding and, and how I used it, it was deer hide that had been processed and it was very, it's very soft. The buckskin dancers have generally their deer hides and uh, they sometimes call them the two hide dress where you take two full deer skin hides and cut all drape one over your shoulders and arms for the top of the dress and then uh, cut the other one half in two and sew part to the front and part to the back and add it all, you know, down the middle. Uh, unless you're really tall and then you might need a three hide dress to, to, to have it be long enough. And uh, I made one once so I could learn about them. And I, I made it as my wedding dress, uh, married to my husband, John, in 1994. So I still have that dress, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't get a picture of it out for you. And I'm sorry, I forgot about that. All right, thank you for that. That's great. Mm -hmm. So Gail Werner asks, um, where do you get your gourds? Oh boy. Well, um, there's a couple of favorite places that I have uh, for Southern California, the Wellburn, W-E-L-B-U-R-N, Gourd Farm. And you can order online. I highly recommend you go to the farm. Uh, just call ahead, but it's wellburngourdfarm.com. Uh, and they're wonderful people. They have, uh, they have anything and everything that you need in the way of working as gourd artist. And they also supply the musicians in Hawaii the, the, uh, for the Ipus, I believe is how they pronounce. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, that's a musical instrument. Um, they're a famous gourd farm that I really do like. ArizonaGourds.com is another one. The, that's a great space. And they have a lot of gourd, uh, gourds and gourd items to, uh, to work with. And then Bruce Gore at AOL.com is the email for Bruce Gore Family Farms where he and his daughters have a gourd farm and they also have exquisite, exquisite gourds. And although I can't think of the name of it right now, there's a, a gourd farm in Kentucky and that's where I get all these these little baby gourds the little miniature gourds I'm told that lady uh only grows the miniatures so they won't hybrid into something bigger 
and I can't think the name of her company, but if you go on uh, eBay and go to arts and crafts and then type in gourds, her farm in Kentucky will come up with all the, the miniatures, they call them miniature gourds. And I, I think I told you that the farmers call these chili peppers banana gourds. All I can see is a chili pepper. It's all I can see when I look at them. So uh, I, I love I love those particular. There are a lot of other gourd farms, but those particular ones are are usually my sort. And sometimes friends gift me with gourds that they run across it. Um, and I, and I'm lucky that that they do that. It's it's always nice to have new gourd people hanging out, and I have a lot. <laughs> All right. So um, we had a comment from Evelyn Lozano. She says, "Thank you. You are so inspiring." And no, yeah. And then Cheyenne Grandi once um, says and wants to ask about. She says, "I'm moved by the idea of the burden basket, and would love to hear more about how this idea is kept alive for you now." Well, generally, it's in my artwork now. Uh, I, I I visited a few. Uh, burden baskets at museums and I've spent a lot of time uh, appreciating them and, and um, asking them to tell me their stories. You know, the, the burden basket is fairly universal on Turtle Island, as I mentioned, uh, as a carrying of uh, actual gathering of food. Um, and um, of course, you can also carry water in gourds, by the way, generally not in the burden basket, but they, they were used uh, on every continent. They grow on every continent. In Africa, actually, they grow on, the plants are so old, they grow on tr their trees. And, and it's amazing. And um, they, they're used uh, primarily by the tribal people in Africa and South America. Uh, uh, today pretty extensively um, and also in Mexico uh, still musical instruments and um, water canteens um, uh, also around the world I have friends Facebook friends uh, from Africa who work with their gourds and make all manner of things the lamp was a little bit inspired by one of my African friends and and so I, I'm really uh, honored that, that you ask about the burden basket. To me, the, my favorite story, of course, is the one about whether you can come in the house with your problems or leave your problems at the door, you know? And I mean, in real life, it's always a good idea to leave your problems at the door, right? But there are people in the communities, in the villages, in, the, in, the, in your life who are willing to be helpers and, and they'll take your burden and, and help you work with it. So that about the burden baskets, they are really, really big. A lot of them have jingles on them even because you wanna scare away animals when you're out in the wild gathering. That's another story that I've been told about the burden baskets is that the jingles, you know, will make, make, the, make the bear run away, which uh, I find humorous. I, I, I don't think bears are afraid of that much, but I could be wrong. <laughs> I've never actually met a bear in person. And I don't know that I'd be big enough to scare them away. <laughs> but um, yeah. Thank you, Nadia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna ask one, one question from Kat. Um, she's asking, do you have work in the Autry International Market? So. Oh, I'm hoping to. I'm trying to get that together. That They moved the date. It was supposed to be this weekend now where we are right now, but they moved it to the 14th. So I got to get my act together on that and check in with Britt. But yes, I, I did send, they do have a lot of pictures of mine that we can use. And whew, I'm glad, glad you asked that question, Kat. I might have forgot about that. See, Kat's one of my little angels. And I, she's my hopey friend. I mean, my hoopa friend, oh, my hopey friend. <laughs> Jerry's my hopey friend. Kat's my hoopa friend. <laughs> so I actually have a couple questions. Um, Yay. I don't know. Do you still have the tool that you use to mark into the gores? Do you have that with oh, you? Oh, boy. Thank you so much. I wanted to see if you could show that to people. Um, Absolutely. 
And Ooh. then, yeah, well, I'll ask my next one after you sh kind of show okay. what you do to do the burning in. Um, of this, the this is the Colwood burning tool. It has its own on off, which I like very much. Cause, and this controls the heat temperature. So it's a variable heat that you can get. And it comes with its own pin and removable and exchangeable uh, tips. I don't know if you can see that very well. This is my favorite uh, wood burning tool and it's coal wood ink out of New Jersey. And you can buy them online. And I strike, as I said before, I strike all my designs in with the wood burning tool after drawing them. Uh, I, and I do some freehand work with the wood burning tool now, which I love. Excuse me, I'm gonna go down here for a second. <laughs> I, I don't know if you heard a while ago, I kind of dropped this, but this is also a wood burning tool and uh, it's called the hot tool, which I don't know where the tip went, but it all has also has a lot of exchangeable um, tips, which, and I like the hot tool because it's simple. However, it just works at one operating speed. So you kind of have to get used to it and know if that's the right uh, wood burner for that particular gourd. Oh, I forgot to show you this silly guy. That was the other thing I was going to ask about. Was this your next question? Yeah. Story, yeah. This, this guy here is a Hayoka. Uh, he's not a Koshari that I'm not, like I said, I'm not Hopi or Southwest. He's not a Koshari, but he is a clown. And in, in my language, we call that the Hayoka. I studied with a few clowns. They're not, they're not contrarians. That's a whole other thing. But the clown makes you know how beautiful you are if you're brave enough to look into the clown's eyes then you can be see be see yourself for your full beauty and most people are afraid to look in clown's eyes so unfortunately they don't get to see how beautiful they are but he is uh, or she sometimes rarely but sometimes a woman is a clown and they will be in and out of the arena and about the gatherings of the powwow and they will be the ones who are chasing people and teasing people and trying to get them to dance or trying to get them to stop dancing or they're just funny funny the hayokas are a little bit of a trickster but when you look straight into their eyes the, the story is they'll show you your full beauty and you're all beautiful Thank you. Love that. Love that. Thank you for sharing that. So um, you're we, welcome. We have another question here from Gail oh. Werner. She wants to know were the lines of the bear on the bear gourd done with the wood burning tool or painted on? Oh, okay. Uh, every design has a wood burning tool. They they get drawn and then they get struck. Now that particular uh, bear piece. Um, if you want to bring up number six again, I can I can show you they're um, they're wood burned and they're colored in, but those bear claws on the side over there that are kind of purple, if you see those bear claws, those are actually um, a relief. I drilled into the gourd to make the claws and the paws, uh, you know, a, a dip. A lower than the edge of the real uh, gourd. So that's a, like a carving tool. I have a little electric, electric carving tool. Um, it's called a gourd carver, of course, but it, it's, it's like, a, it's like a manicurist tool, you know, it's smaller than a Dremel, but bigger than what your dentist drills your teeth with. Ouch. And <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I have such corny jokes. Huh? I love that. The humor is very important. It is. Very, very healing. Very important. We need it during this time for sure. So, yep. Well, uh, right now, it doesn't look like there's any more questions that have come up at this time. Okay. But um, if you if people want to come and see Nadia's work, it is here in person 
um, installed at Greenly Art Space. So you can call us and set up a time to come see it. Um, or if you have any other questions, you're welcome to email me and I can ask Nadia um, for you. So thank you guys so much for, um, oh, let's see. Also, I forgot to mention um, Native Seed Search in Tucson sells gourd seeds. So yes, that's right. That's thank you for Kat. Uh, she wanted to, she wanted thank to you, mention. Thank you, Kat. I should have mentioned that before, and that's very important. Yeah. So native seed backslash search in Tucson sells gourd seeds. So right. All right. Well, we thank everyone so much for joining us today, and thank you so much, Nadia, for all your help. I want to thank Kat and Gail also, who helped in sort of the rehearsals, so that this would thank you, well for you guys. So um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.